Hello, this is Pastor Spencer, the Vacancy Pastor at Peace Lutheran Church in Estacada, Oregon. Today is the last Sunday of the church year, and our message for this Sunday is, Blessed are all who take refuge in Jesus. The text is from St. Matthew's Gospel, the 25th chapter, verses 31 through 46. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Two weeks ago, we heard about the wise virgins and the foolish virgins. They were waiting for the bridegroom to come. Last week, the appointed reading was about the joyful servants and the fearful servant waiting for the master to return. Today, it's about sheep and goats, the third and final teaching of Jesus about the last day. When the good shepherd comes and separates the sheep from the goats, the sheep inherit the kingdom prepared for them from the foundation of the world. The goats, however, they go into the eternal fire prepared not for them, but for the devil and his angels. For God is the God of life and salvation and desires the death of no man. That's just not his way. That's not what he wants. Jesus went to the cross. He went there to save all people. But some people want what they want. That is, they want not God nor his presence, or at least not this kind of God. And so they reject God and his grace. And it's so sad because there's no joy for anyone in that. So sad for us who don't even want to think about it, which is why so many deny it and think, well, God just wouldn't do that. And so they embrace an alternative theology, a false theology. But God's word remains. There's only one way to take away the sin and guilt that separate us from God. And that's the death and resurrection of his son. For sin to be on Jesus and not on you. For your sin to be atoned for by Jesus' blood. Those who have that Jesus have everything. Those who know Jesus have eternal life. And those who do not? <sighs> All depends on the Son. All depends on being in the Good Shepherd's flock. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, Pastor. That's not what the words we heard today say. Jesus points to works, not faith. And so it might seem we are saved by what we've done, or at least by what we have not done. And perhaps it sounds that way, but it's not that way at all which needs to be pointed out today. But you see, you already know that. You know that because it's what you've heard here each year in the readings and hymns and liturgy and sermons. It's what you've read in the scriptures, that we're not saved by works, but by the benefits of the cross received by us by grace through faith. And many of you could quote a scripture that says that. So it's interesting to me how so many Christians, so steeped in this teaching all the other Sundays of the year, so confident in Christ, become so terrified of the judgment at the end of the church year and think it's on us and what we do. That we're going to have to answer for each and every sinful thought, word and deed and desire we've ever had that the Good Shepherd suddenly turns into a horrible and strict judge. And I think the devil whispers that into the ear of believers and unbelievers alike, especially at the end of their life on their deathbeds. But the Good Shepherd, he does not. But if what I just said describes you, don't think I'm condemning you. I am just inviting you to rejoice in the fact that you don't have to fear that type of thought on the last day. The one who is your good shepherd now will be your good shepherd then too. The good shepherd who rebirthed you in baptism, who feeds you here in his supper and comforts you here with his word, who forgives your sins and watches over you and leads you through the valley of the shadow of death, especially according to Psalm 23, 4. And he doesn't stop there. So, when he comes on that last day, as we heard, he's going to act like a shepherd. He's going to separate the sheep from the goats, which is not hard for a shepherd to do. It's not like 
it's hard for him to tell the two apart. There's not a fine line between the two. It's obvious, especially for a shepherd. All you've got to do is separate them. And that takes place not because of what they've done, whether they've been good or not, but because of what they are, sheeps or a goat. And Jesus could have stopped there. He could have stopped his teaching right then and there, full stop, and not even said the rest about all those things that were done or not done, and all would have been just fine. It would have been well. So why does Jesus do that? Why does Jesus drag in his teaching and muddy up the water, so to speak? Well, actually, it's just the opposite. He brings those things in to clarify, not to muddy, and for two reasons. First, to demonstrate the fairness or justice of his judgment. No objection can be raised by the goats that they were improperly put in the wrong group. No, there has been no mistake. By their lives, they showed who they were, not perhaps in the ways that we might notice or see them. We often judge people wrongly or, or are erroneous. But God knows and sees the heart. And notice the goats think that they've been good enough. And maybe they were very good for goats, the best of goats. In fact, praised by the other goats. But even the very best goat is not a sheep. The best unbeliever is still an unbeliever, regardless of their deeds, and so are without the forgiveness of sins. For that comes only by grace through faith in Jesus, and not by those who reject him. The second reason Jesus points to these things is for the benefit of the sheep, for you and me, for we who think we haven't been good enough, who look at our lives and focus mainly on all the ways that we fail and fall short and don't do those things that we should. And if that's the way you think, then you're right. You're spot on. This is something that often happens with Christians, and especially new Christians, those new to the faith. They are baptized, they are catechized, they want to be good Christians, and they try really hard, which is good. But inevitably, sooner or later, as they grow in the Word, they don't see the improvement. They don't think they're getting any better. In fact, they think they're getting worse. Because as they grow in God's Word, they learn to see things more and more clearly, and they see their sin more and more clearly as well. And so think that they're getting worse. Most of the time, they're not. They've just begun seeing clearly the horrible reality of sin. But it seems that it shouldn't be in them, so they think. But you see, we are sinful. We are simul justus et peccator. That's Latin for simultaneously sinner and saint. Now, it's good to see rightly if it pushes you to repent and to turn to Christ and his forgiveness. That's exactly what the law is supposed to do. And then the gospel and the joy of Christ's forgiveness can have its way with us and give us the confidence that our works could never give us. And here on this last day, Jesus' words seem to indicate that the same thing is going on. Sheep that know that they haven't been good enough. So how comforting for us to know that to Jesus we are. We're good enough, not because of what we have done, but because of what he has done, making us his sheep, his sheep where even the little things we've done are precious to him. It's not becoming a pastor. It's, it's not doing the work of an evangelist or, or missionary in some wild and dangerous country. It's not doing things that draw the world's attention. It's these little things Jesus mentions, things we've forgotten and thought of as no big deal. They are the big deal to him. A Christian mother taking care of her child, a Christian father providing for his family, a Christian family taking food to a family that's going through rough times, visiting those who are alone or isolated, caring for those in need. Those things don't wipe out your sin, nor do they earn you eternal life. Jesus did that. And because he did, you can do those things. You can take care of others because of who you are, a sheep in the Good Shepherd's flock, a sheep that's being cared for by the Good Shepherd himself. Or maybe think of it like this. Sometimes people are asked 
the hypothetical question. What would you do if you got a large inheritance or won the lottery? What would you do with it? Now, there's lots of different answers to this, but often exists the desire to help others, to fund a scholarship, to give to a charity, to help friends and family. Well, for you, it's not a hypothetical. That is your reality. You have an inheritance. You have received it in your baptism. It's what the gospel tells you about and delivers to you every Sunday. The inheritance prepared for you before the foundation of the world, as Jesus said to you today. But you have riches beyond your understanding, riches that will never run out. So now what? If you believe this, how will you live? What will you do? Will you live as if this world is all that there is? Or will you live differently? So in the collect of the day today, we prayed, enable us to wait for the day of our Lord's return with our eyes fixed on the kingdom prepared for your own from the foundation of the world. And so with eyes fixed, not on ourselves or on what we're able to do, but on the king and his kingdom, all that he has done for us, and all that he has, has for us, for then we will see rightly. Satan is always trying to have you take your eyes off of that, to get us to look at anything but that, and so cause us to rely on what we do and tremble in fear and at the thought of the last day. Instead, we fix our eyes on Jesus, Hebrews 12, 2, the bridegroom coming for his bride, the church, the master who has joy for his servants, the good shepherd who is both good and our shepherd, not just for now, but for eternity. The good shepherd who always has his eyes fixed on you. The good shepherd who has once again set his table before us in the presence of our enemies. And in the midst of this sinful and turbulent and unbelieving world, so come now and fix your eyes on Jesus here on his forgiveness given to you here, and taste and see that the Lord is good, Psalm 34, 8. So that when he comes again, or even when you just think about that day, you will not tremble and be in fear, but look forward to it with joy, as Jesus does. That day can't come soon enough for him either. To have you and all his flock finally gathered together to be with them forever. That's what he wants. That's why he came. That's why he died. That's why he rose again. And that's why he's coming again for you. That it really is true. What the psalmist said, blessed now and forever are all who take refuge in him. Psalm 34, 8. For in Jesus, all your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And heaven is your home. You see, you have the good shepherd's word on it. In Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.